So I'm so excited to have you, Leslie. Um, I actually came across your work before you started teaching at LCC, I think, and then I kind of saw that you've been teaching a few um, seminars. So I think some of the students have already met you um, and the rest are very excited to meet you. So I'm just going to introduce you um, and then hand over and I'll turn off my camera and mic um, during your lecture. But I'm here and Michael's here if you need any assistance with anything. OK, thanks. Leslie, I'm just going to read out your bio as is traditional. I hope you don't mind. Okay. Sure, no, no problem. <laughs> Leslie Gaston Bird brings over 30 years of audio engineering experience to her work. She currently specializes cook. She currently specializes in mi mixing feature length films and documentaries in stereo and 5.1 and is currently adding Dolby Atmos workflows to her arsenal. She's a governor at large for the Audio Engineering Society author of Women in Audio and is working on her doctorate on immersive workflows at the University of Surrey's Institute of Sound Recording. Recent mu movies she's worked on include rent pal Leap of Faith, um, a documentary on the making of The Exorcist, um, and many others found on her IMDb page. So it's a great honour to have you and I'm really looking forward to your lecture. Thank you so much, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's good to meet everybody. Um, I sort of have my eye on the uh, room um, where people are registering and, and entering. And wow, there's like 54 people here. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, thanks, everyone, again, uh, for bearing with the uh, technical stuff at the beginning of the session. But the times we live in, right? Um, so today I'm actually wearing my Dolby Atmos shirt. I don't know if you guys can see it, but um, I'm very into immersive audio. And uh, so maybe we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, but these are objects. I guess I should sit up a little bit. But these are what are called objects that you can mix in a field of um, basically 360 degrees of surround. So uh, Immersive audio is um, one of the areas where I'm focused, but I also uh, am interested in uh, women in audio. And by that, I mean I've written a book about women in audio, and I love hearing their stories. Uh, and, you know, I've read a lot of articles, tons of articles, you know, that ask this rhetorical question, why aren't there more women in audio? And I managed to find a 100, you know. Um, I wrote, you know, throughout the ages, you know, um, from um, and uh, Ada Lovelace, who's credited with being uh, the first computer programmer. Uh, Sophie Germain, uh, who uh, was French. She lived three centuries ago and she uh, was a mathematician who studied um, the elastic surfaces uh, of steel, for example. So uh, if you look at the resonance of steel, uh, it's something that you might think about if you think about the Eiffel Tower and how it's built and why it's built that way. It has to do with sort of the, the stress that's put on that building and how it's um, architected, for lack of a better word, uh, engineered. And so that was um, that mathematician who sort of solved the problem of how to mathematically predict those resonances. And if you've ever cracked open Ableton or Reaper or Pro Tools or Logic and you look at your reverb plugins, you might actually see a plate reverb. And plate reverb um, is basically uh, putting a speaker driver on a piece of steel and, and vibrating it so that you can hear this echo effect. Well, that was uh, that can be mathematically predicted by uh, the math that so if your man figured out and and on and on through the ages, um, and so it's been my great pleasure to do that kind of research and bring that research to people. So you'll be seeing some of the people that are in the book. You'll be, um, you know, I wish we could do some binaural stuff. We probably could, but I think uh, for the purposes of this lecture, I'm just going to show you uh, some of the capabilities. Um, that we have to do surround uh, sound and um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much an overview of what I'd be talking about today and what I will be talking about today. So um, I'm going to actually share my screen because I put together a little um, keynote presentation and I'm so excited that I know it's going to work. Sometimes you don't know if something's going to work, but today 
I'm confident. So this is uh, just a little bit bio um, about me, and it's uh, you know I'm I'm glad that there are probably some people who have seen this before, uh, because I I think I've showed this to one of the other classes. But for those of you who don't know me, uh, Leslie Gastonbird, I'm a member of the Association of Motion Picture Sound (AMPS). I'm a member of the Motion Picture Sound Editors Guild, which is MPSE. I'm a governor at large for the Audio Engineering Society, and I own my own company, Mix Messiah Productions, and I wrote a book called Women in Audio, and that is a picture of Gunnison Lake, Colorado. That is not where I'm from, but I, <laughs> I loved to visit Gunnison Lake when I lived in Colorado, and so that's just a wonderful uh, scene that I would see uh, as we would drive into the mountains on family vacations. I thought I would share that with you when you see it in up close, it's phenomenal. Um, so I'm from a town uh, in Ohio called Dayton. That's where I was born. Uh, there's a map of the, United, the map of the United States, and you can see a little star in the middle there. And um, that's the state flag. And maybe you've heard of the Wright brothers. Well, they are from Dayton, Ohio, same as me. So I have something in common with those guys. Uh, I got my education in the state next to Ohio, Indiana, and that's where I got my undergraduate degree um, in audio technology. I got a bachelor's degree in telecommunications because back in 1987 they did not have a bachelor's degree in audio technology. So um, those of you who are studying uh, audio and uh, film, um, you know, we've come a long way in terms of academically being able to provide that for you because there weren't always those types of courses. So I drove uh, to Washington, D.C. when I graduated college. We call it college. Um, so uni is what uh, we would say in, in England, right? So when I left uni, I went to work at National Public Radio, which is like Washington, uh, excuse me, which is like the BBC here in England. So National Public Radio is where I worked, and for the first time I got to interview uh, some people. I interviewed Todd Rundgren, but mostly that's Todd Rundgren, by the way, in the picture. And that's me uh, before the dreads. Um, and, yes, yeah, so check out those bangs. What, what can I say about those? So um, I was mostly an engineer, so I, I put that picture up because I got to learn um, some new things. So I got to learn about, yay, Steve loves Todd. Um, he's just an amazing artist, producer, engineer, and um, one of my heroes. So those are that's some of the technology that we used back in the day. Even when I started working at NPR, that console you see in the lower right-hand corner was ancient. It's like from the 70s. Um, but then we also um, got some really nice performance studios, as you see on the left-hand side there. Um, so, yeah, I actually was at NPR, and I was there from the tradition for, for the transition from analog tape to digital audio, and we first used this thing called Sonic Solutions. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, and there is uh, some technology back in the day in 1993, this thing called CD Interactive, and that was one of Todd's projects. So I was interviewing him about this crazy technology where you can put a CD player in and hook it up, a CD and a CD player, hook it up to your television and, like, um, make music <laughs> two different things. It's crazy. Uh, technology. You've never seen a CDI, I promise, because you're probably born the year it came out, and the thing lasted for a year, and then it was gone. All right, but moving right along. Um, so I, um, yeah, we, we won't listen to that. Uh, but I left NPR uh, with these skills, signal flow music recording, razor blade editing, operating a radio board, producing my own stories, live broadcast engineering, and then I moved to Colorado to be the audio systems manager at uh, Colorado Public Radio. So at the tender young age of 26, you know, I was mixing stories for um, the reporters. I was also managing the playout system. So the, um, you know, when you listen to the radio, a lot of that stuff is pre-recorded, and I was programming that computer. So those are some of the things that you can do um, with an audio degree. You can, uh, you know, work at a radio station uh, doing some broadcast engineering and being in charge of, of those kinds of things. Uh, and so the skills that I learned from that point were 
um, signal flow, music recording, razor blade editing, um, operating a radio board, producing, live broadcast engineering, audio systems management. And then I started getting to audio post-production at a company called Postmodern. And this transition wasn't easy. And one of the things I want to convey to you guys is, you know, throughout my long 30-year uh, career, you know, um, during the transition from when I was going to radio to doing sound for film was really, really frustrating. It took, took about four years for me to decide that's one, what I wanted to do, uh, to find somebody who would take a chance on me. And so at Postmodern, um, yeah, they believed in my work, you know, being able to produce stories for up until that point, it had been 12 years in public radio. And so I started by doing restoration of old film soundtracks. We worked, has anybody seen Das Boot? Yes, we worked on Das Boot. So we did the restoration for that film. And uh, that was quite an experience. I learned some German. And so that was educational on a whole nother level. Um, and then uh, from there, shortly after that, I got my master's degree and um, just started teaching. So um, my academic career has been uh, full of academic publications. So I have a little credit roll here of through the year 2014. I'm sure I have some more contemporary stuff. Ah, yes. Uh, throughout the year 2018, I was doing um, all this stuff. So. That is my career in a nutshell, um, and yes, and throughout, you know, throughout this career, I think it's important to know, uh, throughout my career, you know, I just want to talk about the things that I learned, you know, all the way from re soundtrack restoration, I did research, you know, I'm an educator, I started learning about multi-channel audio, um, which is surround sound and more, you know, because now, you know, I showed me, showed you my Dolby Atmos shirt. We can do uh, 22 channels of audio. We can do 100 channels of audio. We can do 128 channels of audio in a, in a cinema, which is uh, pretty cool. Um, but I also learned other things. That this is what they call soft skills. So I learned about uh, customer service, counseling students, collaborating with others, troubleshooting, paying attention to detail, uh, safety. The reason I put safety there is because we had a ceiling collapse in one of our rooms uh, and it crushed. As if anybody knows about the Neve Portico console, we had one of those and it got demolished. It was very sad. But, you know, we had to learn, you know, how to uh, <laughs> make, make sure everybody was safe. It's it, quite an interesting story. Meeting deadlines, the gentle art of persuasion. Oh, yeah, Neve Capricorn. Yeah. I don't know about the Capricorn, but I know Neve, and it's really exciting that they had, you know, we the portico that we had um, was like the fifth in the in the manufacturing line, so it had some heat problems, so we had to keep it cool. But I will look up the Capricorn. That sounds uh, very uh, intriguing. Yes, the general art of persuasion. So making sure if you want a Neve Capricorn or portico, making sure that you can go to your administrators and say, this is why we need this fifty thousand dollar thing and knowing your stuff and being able to make the case. Those are all the things that I learned through my career and hopefully you'll learn through yours. The Audio Engineering Society, I'll talk a little bit more about that later because it's such an incredible networking opportunity. I'm sure you know one of the reasons you guys know me is probably because of my work with the AES and probably because of the connections I've made through the AES. And so that's our board of governors. And it's an international society, so we have members in Japan, Latin America, uh, India, um, Europe, of course, uh, and there's uh, Africa as well. We have a chapter in Nigeria. There's the Women in Audio panel I put together, one of my first forays into this um, specialized area, I guess you'd call it, for lack of a better word, and that's us at the convention with one of my students in New York. Um, my going out on uh, leaving education, leaving academia, I haven't left really because I'm a PhD student now, but when I uh, resigned from my teaching job, I uh, started freelancing and that's my company banner, Mix Messiah Productions. And um, I was uh, in, inducted into the Recording Academy in two.
Um, has anyone else lost Leslie? Yeah. yeah. Oh, coming back. Hey, Leslie, we just lost you there for a sec. Okay, I'm back now, though, Are you right? Back? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm going to have to have a chat with somebody about Blackboard or my internet connection. I don't even know who I'm going to call. So, anyway, I was just talking about um, uh, voting on the Grammys, and you know, I need to get this internet fixed if I'm going to be listening to. <laughs> to those songs. And then my um, book came out uh, on the 20th of December last year. You can read more about women in audio, women in audio book.com. And some of the uh, women that I have featured in the book are Anastasia Devana from Magic Leap. She's the audio director out there and they do augmented reality. So that top middle picture that you see is what you what you see if you look through this magic leap device. You know these characters uh, appear in your environment as though they were really there. For those of you who have experienced aug um, mixed um, and augmented reality, so you will want to um, yes, thank you uh, for ordering the book for the library. That would be fantastic. Um, but this um, this. Augmented reality, of course, you need sound design. So these little creatures that appear on your on your screen need to be making sounds. You guys, you know, should be developing and designing character sounds for these uh, types of applications. So just, you know, be thinking about audio uh, more than a uh, sound for films and more than um, you know, I, I say making beats, uh, people say it in a disparaging way, but of course, you know, beat making is, you know, soul fulfilling stuff. So I don't want to diminish it, but, you know, you can also be applying that love to, uh, for example, performance. So in the uh, middle uh, left hand, you see Pamela Z, that's her name, or Pamela Z, I guess you would say here. I think she calls herself Pamela Z because she's American, <laughs> but she's wearing a device on her wrist that allows her to manipulate sound. Um, some of you might have even seen Imogen Heap's Mimu gloves, M-I-M-U, um, that you can use uh, to do um, uh, basically control sounds in, in, in cool ways. Or you could be a vinyl mastering engineer. Here's Jet Galindo at the bakery. Uh, so she's holding out a freshly minted vinyl LP. Um, we've got Fayla Davis and Dennis. I, I'm, I'm sorry, he's, I cannot pronounce him. Orn Bakov, I'm not really sure. Uh, but he's from Czechoslovakia and she's from South Carolina. And they met each other on Craigslist and now they have a uh, a uh, company called 23DB Productions. And so they do podcasting. So there's all this cool stuff that you guys can do. So that's the end of um, that first um, um, presentation. So any any questions out there? I'll just take a little break before, you know, while I queue up my next presentation to see if anybody wants to um, to pass along any questions. Yeah, hi. Hello there. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. Right. So I'm a long standing AES um, author and member. And for the benefit of everybody else, like, what would you say are the benefits of uh, the students here? Uh, if we've got 60 people in the room, what would you say are the key benefits of joining the AES? I'm a huge AES advocate. So, yeah, I, you, you riff with it. Yeah, okay, I will. Um, I love AES. So the first time I joined AES, um, well, I, you know what, actually, I'm going to rewind to my first experience with AES. They had this blue journal that came out. It's like a blue magazine, and it's called Audio Engineering Society Journal. And at the time, I was studying electronics at Indiana University, and I opened this thing, and I'm like, holy crap. There are symbols in here that I haven't seen since I've taken calculus, and I don't know what they mean. And so it was very intimidating to read the AES journal, and I'm like, I don't know if that's my my thing really. But when I got to uh, my master's degree, my professors, who were Roy Pritz, the late great Roy Pritz, who was uh, education chair and one of the presidents, and Rich Sanders, who started the forensics program, they said you should you should get involved with AES. So the first thing I did was I I joined a, a competition. It was a recording competition, and I submitted this music video that I had done. And my thing was that I had recorded live musicians in different locations and cut the locations together so the audio was seamless. I'm very proud of it. Called it Music Video Verite. 
and uh, I won. You know, so I won this this competition. I, I I got money from my school to fly to Berlin, Germany, and you know, get up on stage. It's the first time I had like given a presentation at an academic conference. What? And I talked about my music video, and I like won this competition. I'm like, this is cool, you know. So that you know, I I thought of the AES as like a scholarly society, which it is, but I didn't realize, you know, at that time in 2004 when I went to Berlin, there was the trade show floor. There's people making microphones that I, you know, the microphones I'd never seen before, loudspeakers I'd never seen before, and around this time when I started going to conferences, I met um, Jamie Angus, who uh, does a lot of work with. Um, noise shaping um, so anytime you you open your computer and it says do you want to dither this thing it's like I met the person who works with the dithering for the noise shaping thing like that person is the real person <laughs> you know uh, you know audio celebrities and in your in your textbooks do you see the staircase thing where it talks about digital audio and you see this thing and you, it said something about aliasing I don't know if you guys cover that kind of stuff but that was Vander Koy and Lipschitz I met Van der Koy and Lipschitz, and that was, um, sorry, I can't, I know Stan, uh, Lipschitz, his first name is Stanley, so Stanley Lipschitz, and um, I can't remember Van der Koy's first name, but, you know, I met the guys who made that diagram that's in every audio textbook on the planet, um, so I was starting to geek out over this stuff, and, um, you know, meeting other students, meeting other professionals, and by now, you know, 16 years later, you know, uh, being a governor of the same society, uh, the students, there's a design competition, so you can build, you can make your own plugin using a program called MATLAB. Um, or if you have a recording that you have that you want somebody to listen to, we have celebrities doing the recording competition judging. So like Mandy Parnell is is based in London, and she's worked with Bjork and Glass Animals and Snoop Dogg, and she's one of the judges at the recording competition. Like you can get feedback from her, you know, this incredible mastering engineer. Um, so I think it's important to look at the at these societies, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But these societies aren't just, you know, you don't just you know pay 50 quid and join some frou frou society. Like this is career enabling stuff, you know, um, to say you want a prize at a recording competition, or to meet the guys who uh, design this microphone, or to develop a relationship with the guys at Genelec loudspeakers, or you know. Um, to learn, uh, our keynote speaker last year was um, uh, Grandmaster Flash. So he taught he taught us the art of record scratching for the first time at the AES conference. Like we had turntables, and he's the guy who in, took scratching to a new level. Is like teaching us, you know, how to do it and how he did it and how and the math behind it. it's incredible. Wow, wow, wow. So definitely look at AES and think about joining. So I think I've. Is that enough of a riff for you? <laughs> Does anybody else have questions? Anyone? How does one get the confidence to join the site? Are kind of pre-written um, for you at the end of the lecture, so don't oh, okay. worry about the. All right. So, okay, sure. So I'll get my next um, my next Lauren slide. Lauren's got a question. Do oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Lauren. So I was just asking how, how would someone get the, if you don't feel confident enough to join these societies, how does one get confidence to do so? Um, well, it's easy, actually. I mean, I don't think you need confidence at all. I mean, you just literally, you can go to your advisor and you can say, um, you know, will you, will you be my faculty sponsor for my application? and um, you join and and that's it you know you start getting newsletters at first um, you don't have to go to the, con the conferences or conventions but you absolutely do um, yes there is a student track so there's the student delegate association and you know what I can do is also just in the chat I could put um, oh I don't see how to, so if somebody could type for me, because I'm multitasking from the brain right now, it's really hard, it's aes.org forward slash students, and um, 
you can learn about the student delegate assembly and um, what are some of the things the student delegate assembly do? They they get involved with AES so the AES is more representative of everyone, right? So they'll advocate for um, uh, what will they advocate for? What have the students advocated for? I'm drawing a blank right now. Um, but but they advocate, for example, for um, software. So if you, uh, you know, for your 50 quid that you pay, um, there's SpectraFoo and um, Lander and um, some other uh, software that you can get for free. I think um, a sound channel is another one, a free subscription to that. So definitely work, worth checking out the benefits of being a member as well. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I, I met a lot of um, students who are shy at first, you know, and they come to the first convention. It's like, holy crap, you know, it's this huge, it's this huge deal. But um, it's you're, you're you're meeting other students as well. So I could go on and on and on and on. I could do, you know, at some point. I hope, you know, if I'm invited back, I'll do something just on it. Audio Engineering Society. Okay. All right. Thank you for your answer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm going to swap my slideshow now. And I'm just going to do a little quick thing about uh, careers in audio just so that we get a, a sense of that. And then I have embedded in this next presentation, I have um, some audio examples and clips to play. So let me go back to careers. And um, so these, these, you know, and this is just sound for film and television. In the book I wrote, I, I talk about radio, film and television, live sound, hardware and software, electronic music. Um, I might have said radio and podcasting already, education, and, you know, I talked about the history as well. So this is just, you know, these next 20 slides or whatever are just sound for film and television because that's what you guys are interested in, I imagine. Um, so um, this is Carol Urban. She's the president of the Cinema Audio Society, which is based in Hollywood. And um, she has something very important to say about the education that you guys are receiving right now. And she says, my education in college, and again, United States College is university. My education in college is very precious, that it gave me a structure in which how to tackle new things that I needed to learn. And it taught me how to learn with people in the projects that I work on. And it taught me collaboration, which is very important. So right now, I'm aware that you guys have to work in teams, right? And this is a very good foundation. But what she's saying is the actual specifics of my job are on the job learning functions. So we'll talk a little bit about um, what those are. And then um, she says, uh, and that's Carol without the mask. Uh, again, she's president of Cinema Audio Society. There's their logo. And she says the best way to get in the position of being a mixer is be a mixer. Go find a student film to work on. And I guess you guys know people working on student films, right? <laughs> I mean, right? But she says, you don't need somebody to give you permission to be a mixer. Be a mixer until the people that you're working with organically become better at what they do. And they bring you along because you help formulate what they create. And as that happens, you'll be more experienced. You'll be more desirable to different companies. And that's how she found herself in a position of being a mixer. So uh, everything, you're doing the right things right now. You know, asking questions about joining the society, being in school, you're on your way, guys. Um, feature films and documentaries. So um, these are the kinds of films that I'm going to be talking about for the next couple of slides. So there's production sound, and then there's uh, boom operator, the boom operator, the A2, uh, responsible for getting uh, sounds from the on-screen talent, holds a fishpole or boom, right? Um, making sure the sound is on axis. And I'm sure, like, if I if I was standing in front of you, I'd ask for a quick show of hands, but it's kind of hard to do when I'm sharing my screen <laughs> on on Blackboard. Um, so, you know, I'll just try and intuit how many people are holding their hands up right now. Um, so there's a picture of Jan McLaughlin. She works on um, an HBO series called The Divorce, and she also worked on When They See Us, which was Ava DuVernay's uh, film about the little... Um, excuse me, the um, Central Park Five. 
uh, which was a uh, terrible time, you know, in American history. But so here's Jan McLaughlin. She, Mike's the actors, she's doing a mix. So she's sitting in front of her cart right now uh, on a hot day. She got on her headphones. And so, um, you know, people are very precious about their carts because you can invest between 30 to 50,000 pounds slash dollars on this cart um and so you know you're an entrepreneur and and you go into debt right away if you want to, you know be your own production sound mixer and so the other thing she does is sound uh sync to time code and uses metadata like what scene what take she passes that on to the post audio team uh then we've got our boom operator this is someone who i don't know but uh, i thought this was a cool picture of the boom op uh, so she's getting sounds from the on-screen talent She's got that fish pole there um, with a shotgun microphone. It's possible to tell which microphone it is because there's a windscreen on it. She's wearing her headphones to make sure her sound is on axis. I don't see her wearing headphones, but if this wasn't like a kind of posed picture, I'm sure she would be wearing headphones. So, um, and then in post-production, here are the various jobs from supervising sound editor to re-recording mixer. That's what I do. So I'm just going to go ahead and boogie through these slides. Um, so here's a picture of Aileen Lee. And she uh, is one of the first women to win an Oscar for both sound editing and sound mixing. And she won that uh, those accolades for First Man, which was uh, sort of about uh, John Glenn's flight to the moon and Neil Armstrong and the third guy. And uh, so she works with the director to understand the general direction of the film's mood, and she oversees the sound crew. And here's a Foley artist. Here's a session uh, that we did up at, um, uh, what's the name of the place? Huh. I just I just based on the name. Wow, I'll get it in a minute. But she's um, basically re recreating the sounds that are on the screen. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with Foley. Well, there's a picture of a Foley session um, so um, we've got a, a shotgun mic aimed uh, at what she's doing on the floor. Um, she could have been doing footsteps right now, right there. I'm not really sure. Can't remember. But I tell you what, let's listen um, to some Foley sound. So this is a, a film we did called A Feral World. And you'll get to see sort of like our, our Foley session. So in this picture, I'll explain what you're going to see because you're going to hear my voice but it's gonna be my voice coming from this video I'm about to play you. It's kind of confusing. <laughs> and on the right hand side of the screen, you see an arm. So that is the arm of Kelly, who you saw um, in the convention antics photo in my last slide show. But she is gonna be doing footsteps for something. Now here's, here's the interesting thing about this particular Foley session. I'm in London, they're in Denver, Colorado. And so we're doing a Foley session. We call it Foley Across Continents <laughs> using a software called Source Connect. So um, I will now play, and hopefully you'll be able to hear um, this Foley session. Is that first kid? Yes. Okay. All right, so here we go. You want me to keep going when he goes down the hall? Yeah. I'll give you, I'll back up and give you okay. some more for that. Okay. Rolling on 150, is it Josh ready? Yep. Rolling. Ac action. Good, thank you. Cut. So what was interesting in that session is there's a whole bunch of stuff going on, but that was just a pass for the footsteps for the little girl who walked in, in on screen and then walked off screen. So she was making the footstep sounds, you know, for the character who was off screen at that point. So that, um, you know, and you heard some a little bit of delay in the communication. That's because, you know, the audio was traveling 4,000 miles mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, so that we could talk to each other. So it was a really fun uh, session uh, that we did. 
Uh, and then uh, here's the Foley editor who took those sounds that we did during that session. And this is Anna Stully. She is in London. And she's responsible for recording the Foley artist. Uh, in this case, she did some additional Foley. And then choosing the best, most realistic take for the scene. Sometimes almost ed also edits the sound and adds reverb maybe to make the sound realistic and to make it fit in the picture. Um, on to sound effects editor. This is, um, <laughs> hold on just a second. Um, well, I didn't expect for her name to leave me so suddenly, but I know she's based in, wow, the, you know, I think next time I'm going to have maybe like a Diet Coke or something before I get on, but I just completely spaced. Um, but she's a great, um, engineer because and the reason I know she's great is she's the first woman in India that's where she's from she's the first woman in India to get an award from the president to be uh, about being the first um, uh, woman audio engineer in India so that's an actual award that she got um, and this was she received that award in 2016 so that's kind of amazing the first audio engineer in India gets an uh, who's a woman um, gets her award 2016 that says something about the industry at anywho. Um, so uh, sound effects editors are finding sounds from environmental ambience, um, room tones, special effects, maybe even like explosions, battles in outer space, car chases, shootouts, or maybe no sound at all. So um, that's something that a sound effects editor might uh, be working with. Uh, moving right along, uh, and now we're going to get into um, some drones. So um, I have a little demo to show you. That movie that I was just showing um, called A Feral World is um, a, it's a post apocalyptic tale of survival. Uh, it was shot over four years. There's a young boy um, who is the director's son. And he uh, started in this film, I think, when he was 10. And they wrapped filming for this film when he was 15. So we get to see this young man go from um, boyhood to um, adolescence. And uh, there's a bad guy in the film. There's the bad guy. His name's Jasper. And there's some uh, visual effects they did for all you visual effects aficionados out there of a swarm of nanobots. And... Um, they appear uh, on the screen, and uh, he, I also received, as a re-recording mixer and supervising sound editor for, for this film, I got a rendering of what those little microbots are supposed to look like. So I can be thinking about what kinds of sounds those little things are going to make. So I'm going to dump out of my um, presentation for a second. Oh, no, actually, I'm going to show you a couple things. I'm going to show you some of the drones that I used for the nano drones. Um, there's my son's red helicopter and my son's uh, little, we call them the dragonfly drone. And I use those because they make these, you know, spinny whirring sounds, which we'll hear in a second. Um, but then I also found uh, my daughter's toothbrush. She uses a little electronic toothbrush uh, with frozen characters on it, but it makes this cool <laughs> sound. So I decided um, to use that. So let's take a moment and I will um, stop sharing my screen long enough to load uh, some of these um, some of these sounds. So let me just make sure I have to go to loop back again and make sure sound particles is in there. Yes, it is. Um, so there's a program called Sound Particles, S-O-U-N-D and then Particles. And I'm going to open that now so that you guys can see it. And I have to go back and share my screen. And here we go, application sound particle. So um, what you see on your screen, do you see these little dots kind of emanating from the top of the screen? You can actually load sounds into this program and make those make individual sounds come like they're sound like they're coming from these little point sources. So this is a preset called flying out of the cave. There's also one called bees. So you can make it sound like things are coming from uh, from the left and being panned over to the right. 
Um, there's this thing called the ring where you can make it sound like sounds are spinning around you. There's um, uh, flying by. And some of these are used, uh, for example, in Game of Thrones, like to make uh, maybe a dozen characters in chain mail sound like thousands of soldiers, right? And I'm saying Game of Thrones and, ch and chain mail as if I've actually seen Game of Thrones. I haven't. I know it's sacrilege, right? Um, but here we go. With, I'm going to try flying out of the cave. And what I'll do is in this, you know, I'm going to play uh, some of the audio files that I created for this. So one of the files, and you're not going to be able to see my computer for a second because I, I, I'm doing a drag and drop thing from my finder. Um, but let's see. Um, so this is the thing where I was saying earlier um, that my indexing on my hard drive uh, has taken a vacation. So I'm just going to look for some drones here in a folder. And I'm going to bring over some of these sounds. So for example, this is uh, electric toothbrush. Okay, so that's just a little loud. I wonder if I can use loopback to turn sound particles down. I bet I go to options and then turn that down to like 60%. Did I do it right, Michael? I think I did. So let's go back to sound particles and listen again. So that's what it'll sound like if I have that little electronic toothbrush, electric toothbrush in there. Um, so what if I add even more? So I'm, I'm going to drag like a, like four or five things over there. And so let's see what it sounds like when I drag five things over there and it'll render for me. And let's uncheck these and Check my red zone. <laughs> it is so loud. Hold on, I'm gonna have to turn this down. I think even more because it, it just sounds like a mind. yeah. So it sounds like a distorted mess. So I'm just gonna turn that down to 30% on loop back and hopefully. This it the won't spider's sit. really um, not well. Uh, the values don't make sense. So it's like either 100% or like you have to bring it right down to. 20, 30 percent actually. Oh, okay. Well, let me try. Um, I'm gonna try 20 percent then. Yeah. Let's see if that works. Okay. The name of the program is Sound Particles. Thanks, everybody. So let's hear what um what this crazy thing sounds like now. Um. So here we go. All right. Let's try again. So there's this. I'm sure. You may or may not be able to see this little green bar up here, but it's actually rendering all those sounds for me. So here we go. All right. So it's taking all those little sounds that I made and, and making them sound like a flyby. What, but what we really need to listen to is just the sound by itself. So I'm going to see if I can um, go to Pro Tools and just play the sound by itself just so you can hear it. Um, and forgive me if this isn't uh, so easy, but I'm going to do my best. So, um, let's see. Hmm, not so much. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Just, just one moment. While I get it together over here. So I'm going to stop my share for a second. And then, um, you know, just to make this relevant, I just sort of want you to hear like one of these. Let's see if this works. Not so much. Can I play songs from, uh, can I play audio from QuickTime? I bet I can if I add QuickTime as a source and loop back, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me do that quickly. 
So is is Pro Tools not playing? Um, no, I it, this was um, operator error, so I had um, I didn't pull the that sound into that session. So this was okay. just um, uh, lack of preparation no on my part. So no um, QuickTime player, thanks. Um, QuickTime player over here. Let's hear what just this um, one of the red drone sounds like. So that's, you know, that's kind of the boring sound of a, a toy. But as you just heard, you know, when you put four or five in that, four or five of them and layer them together, you can make it sound like, you know, a swarm of things coming at you. So um, that is merely what I wanted to show you. Uh, yeah, so the name of the program is Sound Particles. Lots and lots of fun to use. They have an educational version. They have a trial version, so you can try it out. Um, it doesn't have to be things that go buzz. You can put a guitar in there. You can put a voice in there. You could put uh, the, the sound of footsteps or keys to make it sound like marching or chain mail. So it's just, you know, really incredible to think about, well, what what kind of stuff can I just mess with, you know, and, and what would it sound like? And then you can do, you know, like um, the guys working on Star Trek are using sound particles. You know, the guy who invented sound particles got a cool award and et cetera. Um, so just going back to my um, my keynote here and um, picking up where I left off. Um, so, yeah, being a sound designer can be really cool because you get to do things like record your kids <laughs> toys and toothbrushes. Um, next, we go to the dialogue editor. Um, so she's responsible for making dialogue intelligible and pleasing and matching sounds from one thing to another. So um, on any given day, you could be recording dialogue in a scene and you have, say, a couple sitting at a table. Um, perhaps on another, you know, uh, on take two, somebody's outside the window um, trimming the hedges of the property where you, you've got the location suit or there's more traffic or you're shooting at night. And so, you know, um, if that scene is supposed to take place over the co course of, you know, a 30 second conversation and you're blending all these different takes, you could have any number of acoustic challenges right on the set for that day. So that's what our dialogue editor does. Um, our ADR editor, this is a cool ADR studio. I have never done ADR and I've never done, certainly never done ADR in a studio that looked like that. Um, but she's going to choose the right mic for the actor and set up a looping session. So here's an actor overdubbing their part for a movie. Let's all make it a goal to have a studio that looks that nice. I think that's pretty awesome. Um, the music supervisor, she's uh, researching music that can be used in the film sometimes in addition to the original music. And so make sure that the cue sheets are done and the music is properly licensed. So you want to make sure that you get clearances for your music. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with that. Um, oops. Uh, we've got uh, the composer. This is a picture of Kei Huang, and she's from Taiwan. And she um, started composing at a very young age. I think she might have been 17 in this picture. And she's got some vintage gear there. Of course, it was cutting edge at the time. So she's writing music according to the director's vision and sometimes uh, with an actual orchestra. Maybe she's doing everything in the box with sampled instruments. And so what kind of considerations? I'm sure you've talked about this in your classes. Tempo, uh, uh, to add, add maybe to drive the film, maybe adding the right sense of drama and tension and humor with uh, different instrumentation. And then we've got a music mixer. So she's actually editing the music and preparing stems. So when I am mixing a film, I will have uh, stems, um, maybe eight or nine stereo tracks so that I can maybe take the percussion out if I've got lots of footsteps in the film or uh, take the footsteps out and replace it with the percussion because it gives you know a, a different sense of drama. So it's nice to have options when you go to mix the film. And um, the mixer might also be panning the music to give a sense of envelopment as well. And then there's me, the re-recording mixer. And I love the way Carol put it, puts it. She's, she says the re-recording mixer is like the chef. So the sous chefs are dialogue editors, Foley editors, who get the ingredients and chop them up and put them in uh, the right shapes and sizes. And the chef is the recording mixer who cooks it, sautés it, pans it around the room cooks it just right and presents it. So that's maybe what a re-recording mixer does. 
Um, and then uh, Jess, we, I was um, talking about life after u university, life after uni. So um, there's a great uh, career panel. You can actually download this. I won't play it here, but it's on YouTube. So if you look for the Sound Girls Career Paths, Sound Girls has their own YouTube uh, channel, so you can actually look at that uh, video. Um, there's also a great one um, that uh, the BAFTA sessions did. Uh, uh, you good can afternoon, definitely everyone. Definitely have a yep. look at that, and I will make sure that you guys have a uh, link to that. And um, then there's a couple of things that you can do uh, if you're a student and you're looking for societies to join. The Association of Motion Picture Sound has a student membership, so why not join? Um, and your course 2i tour. Oh dear, Leslie. Surely you could have taken that eye out. <laughs> your course tutor can sponsor your membership. Um, also, Beck2 has student membership. So they're at the um, television union. Uh, I can't remember what the BC stands for, but they make sure that they're negotiating fair rates. So um, you do not have to work for $15 an hour, excuse me, 15 pounds an hour. You uh, can go on to Beck2, look at the rate cards, and see what is a fair um fair uh, rate for you to be paid. And that's because the union is working on your behalf and they have a student membership. So does the NPSC. They're based in uh, the United States, but I do believe they have an international membership. And the Audio Engineering Society, of course, we talked about that a little bit um, earlier and they have a tiered kind of student rate. Sorry if I'm triggering anybody with my use of that word, but there's it's $50 uh, US dollar equivalent for your first year um, post-graduation, and then it goes up from there. And then there's also uh, BFI and BAFTA run a um, mentoring scheme and a network scheme. Um, and this is once you get two to four broadcaster feature credits, and then you can be part of this, again, networking, networking. People are always preaching networking. Um, so it's something that you should definitely look at. So that is where I will stop this part of the presentation. And I will, um, again, see if there's anybody out there who has questions. Kai, I think you had a question, didn't you? Do you want to come on the mic and ask Leslie? Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah. Ideal. Um, I was basically just going to ask, um, with all those like different forms that you can do for like sound, um, like post production and things like that, um, is it common for for a person to just choose one of them to specialize in, or could, is it good to just sort of do all of them now and then eventually you'll do like one specific one? If that makes sense. Yeah, it, it makes sense. I think um, the easiest thing to do while you're a student is just to try a bunch of different ones. You know, um, you know, some people like my least favorite thing to do is footsteps, fully footsteps. May I never have to do another fully footstep session. It's tedious stuff. Um, but there are some people who love fully, like that's all they want to do. You know, they want to, you know, get in front of the mic and really, you know, try and get the right texture for the film and experiment with sounds. So, you know, there's some things that you're going to find that you don't want to do. Like some people don't want to hold the boom. You know, I wouldn't, I don't mind holding a boom. Um, some people get intimidated by Pro Tools sessions with, you know, 250 tracks on there. They're like, oh, good Lord. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to do that. And there's some people like me who are like, that's exactly where I want to be, you know. You know, I want these gigantic sessions on my computer and I want to do all this complicated routing and I want to mix and surround. And um, so there's some people for whom, you know, that is a better match. Um, so definitely. Uh, but in terms of does it give you an advantage? No, I don't think that being able to do more than one thing gives you an advantage. I just think the reason to do it is to sort of try it, try it out and see if you like it. You know, and then to specialize, you know, definitely, you know, if you can market yourself as the best dialogue editor or a very experienced Foley artist, then, you know, people know what, you know, what to come to you for. So on a self for self promotion and self marketing, it's probably good to specialize. Jessica, you have a question. Hi, Leslie. Hello. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for today. Um, 
I've got a question really for the students because we have a, um, I've been teaching the module Applied Sound. Some of the students are um, here today listening to your talk. Um, just some advice really. They're mixing in stereo for this, uh, for their films that they're going to be um, doing. But um, they have the opportunity. I'm encouraging them to work and to experiment with 5.1. And also we have Dolby Atmos set up as well. So for Sweet. someone that's mixed in 5.1 and Atmos, um, any, you know, beginner kind of approach as to how they might uh, approach their films if they want to experiment in Atmos? Any tips or...? You know what? I actually, I actually got a template from the guys at Netflix. Um, I'm sure they would love for me to share it with you. I need to find um, a shortcut to that, and then I can type it in the chat. So if you guys bear with me, and and so it's it's um, I think the best thing to do, right, is to get your feet wet and to actually try it. So um, let me just look here and see if I can find the link. I mean, what for someone that's worked in both 5.1 mixing and Dolby Atmos? What would you be able to just say a little bit about the difference in is there a difference in how you might approach the mix? I mean, of course there is, but is there a way to sort of simplify that somehow? Yeah. Um, so let me uh, let me just throw this in the chat window real quick, uh, just so that you guys have it. Um, good Lord, let me. What is the what is the secret? to actually entering text in the chat window. Like, um, that's not can I do? I don't know why that's not working. <laughs> can I do that? Does yes. everybody see that? Oh, okay. Okay. So just in terms of I'll sort of an that. aesthetic approach. Sorry? Oh, no, it's fine. Sorry. You just wrote it just to the moderators, but it's not a problem. I'll post it to the students. <laughs> yeah, somebody could, because I don't know what's going on with that. Um, yeah, so working, going from stereo to 5.1, I think the most important thing is, is to learn about what the center channel is and what it does, and psychoacoustically, the implication of, of panning things to the center, right? So, or assigning things to the center channel. So dialogue always goes to the center channel. And what you'll find is that it might sound less present. And that's because there's this rapping thing. <laughs> and it's really funny to learn about that. But the frequency 2 kilohertz, the wavelength of that frequency is like 6 inches. And like your head is 6 inches wide. Like, do you believe me? Like, actually, like, measure your head. It's like 6 inches wide or something. And so the, the, the psychoacoustically speaking, that 2K frequency maybe cancels out, you know? So a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, you, if you are panning dialogue to the center channel, you need to boost around around 2K. I mean, you know, I'm not gonna say the word fathead, but if I were, you might or may not assign yourself to that category, in which case you might need <laughs> a different frequency. Do you see what I'm saying though? Just something to think about. Um, so <laughs> I, hope, I hope I didn't insult anybody. What a horrible thing to say. Why would anybody call anybody that? Um, so, the um, but thinking about the um, <laughs> thinking about uh, just the the implications of panning things behind you, right? So now you've got a center channel that um, is going to sound different than your left and right channel. If you're panning things from left to right across the center channel, it might sound a little bit different. So if you're doing a pan from left to right, maybe you don't go through the center channel, or maybe you do go through the center channel. Maybe you have to go through the center channel because of this thing called the law of first arriving of uh, reflection, uh, first arriving sound, right? The ho is it the Haas effect? No, that's the reverberant one, one. So if you're, um, you know, if you're in the left, of a theater, if you're sitting on the left side of the theater and you have a sound pan to the left and right, people are on the left side of the theater. I think are they going to think it's coming from the left, right? <laughs> Stay with me. So if you're panning stuff from the left to right, if you're not using that center channel, there's a possibility that it might just all of a sudden go to the right channel. Or maybe not. I mean, these are the kinds of things you have to think about when you're making those decisions, right? Um, then there's also the rear channels. So psychoacoustically, those channels are a little bit diminished because, you know, your head is in the way or your pinnae are in the way, right? Um, 
of that sound. So there's like a seven kilohertz drop when you're panning sounds to the to the rear channels. Um, and then just thinking physically about where the tweeters are in the cinema, right? So if you're panning something from the front to the back, it might sound like it's coming over your head because the tweeters are physically over your head. So making use of the full range of, of um, sound, you know, to make uh, smoother transitions. Um, what's the other thing? Somebody told me years ago that if you want it to, to creep somebody out, like you're making a horror, horror movie, and you want the effect of somebody walking behind you, like coming up or sneaking behind you, you should dip the high frequencies in the rears right when that thing happens because that's the kind of thing that freaks a person out. Like, is, is somebody behind me? It's because you have to turn around because those high frequencies have gone, right? So you have to turn around to get the, the spatial effect um, of being able to see what the hell is, is, is about to eat you all right, so that's just a little trick that somebody saw. I've never used it, but I, I think one of you definitely should. And please tell me what it is. I will pay money to go see that film. Um, yeah, I think, have I answered the question about going from stereo to 5.1? Yeah, that that's great. Yeah, I, I guess it was also um, for 5.1 to Atmos as well, because, you know, working with objects is, is very different. Mm. So, uh, so... I think from 5.1 to Atmos is um, sort of what they they have this uh, analogy of the florist. So when you're creating your beds in Atmos, which is like your 7.1 static channels, that you should treat those as like the forest that never moves. You know, so your trees and your leaves and your sky and your rain is is static, and then the the objects that are moving those are your creatures in the woods so you know the bird that flies is the object right so th those things can move um so the i guess the general mix approach is to make sure you know you have that static palette that you're working with and then you know you can have fun uh, moving stuff around one of the um challenges that uh um that you might face working in atmos is is attaching a reverb to an object Right. So if you have a let's just stick with the forest analogy. So if you have a bird that's flying from the back right corner to the front left, when he's in the back right, the reverb would be coming from the front left. It just as an example, when the bird moves to the front left, will hypothetical question, does his reverb stay there or does his reverb change so those are the some of the kinds of things that you have to think of if you're in the back right corner you hear the sound bouncing off the front left wall if somebody moves to that channel then the the reverb moves too so how are you going to work with that in atmos you know do you have to set up um some sort of pan law between two things so that when you move something you know all that stuff is moving in relation to it or do you just throw up your hands Create a 5.1 reverb, <laughs> leave it there, and then let the let the algorithm figure it out. So th those are just some challenges to think about moving from yeah. 5.1 to Atmos. You know, and then of course if you've then it you've got your side channels if you're doing 7.1 going for 5.1. Um, so then again, working with things like um, ricochets or something, if they're are they going to go through your head or are they going to go around the side of the room? So you have to be cognizant of how that sound is going to behave when you have speakers on the side of you as well. And then speakers on top, um, again, with the helicopter analogy, you know, where that look, you can do better with it, even though I think in real life, if you've got helicopter flying overhead and you hear that sort of low rumble of the helicopter, if you try and pan it from front to back, I think it's harder because you've got the low frequency sort of going through your body. And I don't think you really feel it because low frequencies aren't as directional. Sorry to get into all the psychoacoustics. But if you take out some of the rumble and you focus instead of the, if you can make those blades sound like they're coming above you, then um, it has a better effect, I think. That's great. Thanks, Leslie. And, and do you do you, do you find that the track lay has to be considered more, you know, for the, you know, you have to consider if you're working in Atmos, do the um, editors have to give you something a little different? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it depends. I mean, if you're, if you know you're going to be working in Atmos from the start, then hopefully there's a template you can share with everybody and everybody can mix to that template. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That's a good question. I know. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah, you're yeah, talking I mean, about it's, a, it's, a, it's a big subject, isn't it? I mean, it's hard, it's hard to not be in a studio to sort of explain explaining it like this is difficult, isn't it? Rather than yeah. demonstrating it is a whole different experience of it. So. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, yeah, so let's... Thank you. Oh, poor Lauren. Oh, we're so sorry. <laughs> so we were just talking about if, if uh, Dolby Atmos. So what the hell is Dolby Atmos? I have it here on my sleeve. What is this Dolby Atmos people are talking about? So... Um, Dolby has set up with so Dolby has set up a sound format that basically tries to recreate 360 degree sphere of audio, right? Um, and so if you can imagine that you you have speakers all over the room instead of just in front of you left and right. So imagine that you can put sound coming from any speaker in the room. You know, if you have a uh, a bird in a tree, you know, you want it up there, right? And what, if you're only working with stereo left and right, then your bird has to be either over there or over there. And that's the only place that bird can go. If you're working with 5.1 surround, you have left, center, right, left surround, and right surround. You cannot put a bird in a tree if you only have five channels. Well, Dolby is trying to give us the opportunity for putting birds in trees, and they're so clever they're claiming that they can do it, you know, they can sort of mix it down to 5.1 and use some psychoacoustic tricks to make it sound like you, you've got that height channel. Or if you want to invest a little bit more money, you can actually put a speaker, you know, in your living room. You can put your speakers in the ceiling and you can have the bird coming from, I mean, you know, you can have the bird uh, coming from, from in the tree. Um, so just to make a, a long story short, Dolby Atmos is, is a way of trying to get get away from the planar, P-L-A-N-A-R, planar approach to sound and make it more spherical and more enveloping, more immersive, if you, if you like. What advice would you give to people working in stereo? What should they get to grips with on stereo first before they move on to... Um, Sound, sound, sound. Um, what should you, the last part of the question is what should you understand about stereo before you move? As in like what, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> As in yeah. what, should you, what should you know within working with stereo when you're mixing with stereo before you start to move on to that kind of stuff? Um, I think the thing with stereo is that even from you know, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, when we started even knowing what stereo was, and I know there's some some uh, very strict people would say it was the 30s, but just bear with me. So historically, we've only ever had two channels. You know, our, my mom and dad had two channels, and that's what you have. And so anybody doing sound design for just two channels had to say, well, how can we make it sound big? You know, and the answer for how to make it sound big was to use the three dimensions of space um, in sound design. So if you have something that's dry, like dialogue, if, if you have a dialogue channel that is dry and you have no reverb on it, it'll sound like it's, it's very close. For example, pardon me, my microphone is going to make a little noise now, but, oh dear. So if I'm talking to you like this, this is a dry signal and I sound very close. If I start moving the microphone away and away and away and away and away, I start sounding further away. So in order to make something, you know, sound closer far away, thank you, Mr. Microphone, you're adding reverb, right? So that's how you get a dimension of spatiality in a mix. You don't want things to be too dry. You don't think you don't want them to be too wet either. Um, in order to make something sound high, you know, so if you want the dimension of height, you can use the trick that I talked about just now, which is, you know, leaning towards where your tweeters are. So the high frequency speakers, you know, on your tweeters, you might be able to have something sound higher up. It doesn't work with headphones, though. So if your listener is going to be listening on earbuds, they'll have to say it's just tinny. It's tinny, you know, 
But back in the day, people didn't listen to the television on headphones, you know. So, like, all these tricks, you know, it's like how how can you even predict what your listener is going to be listening on? What should you know about stereo? So there's left and right, and then there's the range of frequencies that you're dealing with. The more frequencies you have, the louder it might sound, and it might also sound spacious, or you could have loud and... Um, uh, excuse me, enveloping if you have a lot of frequencies. So you're using the full range of uh, frequencies, it might sound enveloping. Or if you're, um, wait a minute. Ah, or you could even just simply pan something from left to right. So you have that dimension of space as well, left or right. Um, so those are the things that you should understand in stereo is left, right, near, far, and to a certain degree, high and low, but it doesn't really translate when you have headphones on. Cool, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're welcome. Leslie, I just wanted to ask, because there's a few, there's some students who have got some questions prepared, and I didn't know how okay. much of your lecture you wanted to to do. Um, but um, no, let's let's go to some questions, because they're um, let's see what what happened and yeah. what is revealed. <laughs> okay, well, if you had some more stuff that you wanted to um, talk to the students about. So we've got about 40 minutes um, and we normally mm -hmm. kind of at least half an hour for questions. So if you wanted to do a little bit more lecturing, you're welcome to, or we can go straight into some questions. Um, well, I could play. So I did have prepared um, a scene from a movie. So let me open that uh, up for you guys. And then I will share it. So this is a movie called A Feral World. Yeah. And again, I, I have to apologize, but in the last, I swear, in the last 24 hours, um, my computer has stopped indexing files. And so basically what that means is um, when I go to search for a file, it tells me it can't find it, even though I might, you know, be looking at files with a similar name. It just says, I don't know. I don't know how to help you, Leslie, find your file. So I have to navigate through more windows than I would usually do. So it's opening now. Thanks for your patience. Uh, the movie Feral was a, um, like I said, a four-year process. And it uh, started with the... Um, uh, a director approaching me and saying, hey, I want to shoot this movie, uh, or I've shot this movie, do you want to do sound for it? And I thought it was going to be a one-time thing, and then he says, oh, and we're going to shoot it, we're going to do another version next year. And I'm like, oh, okay, a two-parter. And then he said, there's another year and another year. And eventually this turned into a feature-length film. Um, and so we are now opening said film. Um, we are trying to open said film. Do bear with me. I feel like I should maybe take another question while this is going. So does anybody want to fire one off and I will get this open for you guys? Hi, right, Leslie. This is Stuart uh, Roberta. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'll just read you a question off the, uh, off the notice board that we had for students. This okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it just says, given your experience working with the Audio Engineering Society, is there any advice you can give to sound students looking for work or anything you've found that may influence um, the near future of the sound film industries? Um, I think, yeah, near future, I think it's all, it's all been about um, remote work, right? So trying to find workflows where you can have your actor sit in a closet doing their ADR lines and then bring it in and match it. So all of these cool little plugins that Isotope is doing, like um, Dialog Match and um, things like that, I think have uh, really are, are changing the game um, and, and finding solutions for this. Like I was talking about Source Connect earlier. And um, this, even the program that I'm using uh, today to bring you the audio, like um, loopback, I mean, these are things that 
maybe we could have done uh, with or without uh, a year ago. And now um, coming this year, it's like, you know, no, I, I, I super need dialogue match because I have <laughs> somebody who had, they could not come to the ADR studio. They recorded their line of dialogue on a phone. So um, being nimble with that kind of technology. And I think as students, you, you can definitely crush it. You can say, yeah, you know, I was working online for a year. You know, I definitely know um, how to get sound in and out, you know, and play sound for stuff. So that, that's something that you can add to your CV, right? Um, and then I think immersive sound and, and Atmos are, are becoming bigger. But even for games, like um, the immersive sound format is RO3D. So um, that is a format that allows you to do um, uh, surround sound audio for video games. Um, and all those uh, things apply, but this time we're talking about working with binaural sound. So binaural uh, means, you know, binaural, two ears, and um, trying to create, using the science of the shape of our head, trying to recreate the sensation of something being up, down, left, right, behind you. And there's some pretty exciting developments in that. So um, being up to speed on that and then joining, um, I mean, seriously, getting uh, in one of these societies and starting to network, those are, are absolutely things that um, you guys should uh, think about doing. I'm just gonna play something from my computer right, right now just to make sure it works. Yeah, there they are. Um, so, and I just saw a question pop up, Annie. I'm looking for my Oh, no, don't worry. I'm just quoting James's question in case. Oh, OK. Um, so you've already answered that. OK. Um, so I'm just going to um, go back here. Just a moment. No, sure. I'm not. OK, so um, here is a scene from Feral. And this is uh, the scene that involves the um, drones that I was talking about. So uh, I'm going to share my screen and <laughs> oh Leslie, application window. <laughs> um, if only I could describe what I am seeing right now. It's hilarity. Um, I want to share all of Pro Tools, but I have to choose which window. Should I just do my entire screen? Yes, but I need to move my Blackboard collab out of the way, or at least minimize it so you don't get the infinity looking thing. Screen one, share, minimize. Ah, that worked. Okay. So this is, um, this is where you get to see um, the drones kind of come to life. And maybe I'll make that a little smaller so you can see the edit window. Um, and and uh, a little bit earlier, you had seen um, where we were talking about um, the, des the design of what these little things look like. So that is um, what the drone looks like. And then uh, in a couple of scenes, a uh, couple of um, seconds later, you're going to see these things, you know, come out of the box. And so all of these things are what I'm, I'm using to um, to create the sound. So the bad guy is telling um, the mom that uh, he designed, he was, he helped architect these um, scary little microbots that can destroy things and people. And um, she thinks he's insane. So here we go. I'm going to mute my mic and hopefully it'll work. What you guys look like? One is harmless. But as a swarm, they can devour any biological material. Non-biologics pretty effectively, too. But then, you know that already. Not what you expected? Here, watch this. I don't have as much control as the entity, but I can still do all sorts of fun things. You're insane! No, I'm not.
so I can, um, on one of my computers, I can actually see and hear what you guys see and hear. And it's very, for me, it was very um, sort of stuttered and pixelated. And um, how was your guys' experience? Was it, so, could you get the idea of what was going on there? Yeah, I could see it pretty well. Okay, cool, cool. So hopefully other people could as well. Yeah, so, oh, good. Okay, good. I'm glad. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, so in this ex example, I, I used a, a couple of different layers. You know, as the as the um, creatures were coming out of the box, I actually used the sound of pouring sand. So that was this. Oh, really? Because that says sand pour, as it must be this one. Do I have something grouped? Sorry, hold on a second. Why doesn't why doesn't my sand pour sound like a sand pour? That might be because oh, I think I know why. Sorry guys, it's one of those things where <laughs> I have to remember my signal flow, and that is why. So this should be solo safe, and now hopefully you can hear my pouring sand effect. Here we go. Some of my music is um, there too, so it's hilarious. So I wanted to get that sort of gritty sound of a bunch of um, animals coming out of a of a box and then you also have like this this loop of music that's playing that's that's bothering me that I can't seem to <laughs> know where it is I think it's this one uh, or this one I love the undo button because I'm just like completely janking at my session so you guys can hear like some sand but here here we go there it is. All right. Thanks for bearing with me. It was really important for me that you hear the sat the sand. <laughs> um, and then there's another session where I've got um, when they're going around her face. I had some fabric fluttering because I wanted this. I wanted it to sound like they were really sort of wrapping around her um, her face there. So I actually put in like a flap 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 as they go around her face there you know because there's there's sort of like this whipping motion that they make and I wanted to catch that um, and then there's one oh yeah it's it's so data compression um, so my daughter has one of those beaded door frames and so I used this you know to make them sound like they were kind of running into each other so That's my that's my daughter's door frame, right? So I I just uh, blended all of these to make it sound like. This. So those are some of the fun fun things you can do with sound design. Um, yeah, shall I, shall I take some questions? Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Who wants to go next? Stuart, I don't know if Daniel, you had some? Either of you, please go ahead. Um, uh, cross industry application of immersive sound tools. Oops, you know what? Sometimes, um, I'm, I apologize, but I have um difficulty seeing like a chronological list of chat questions so i think it's probably better if somebody reads the questions yeah sure. shall we read it out or it i don't know if you want um and so yeah uh hi leslie my question is regarding the cross industry application of immersive consoles could the understanding of dolby atmos for example be a transferable skill to other industries such as vr and video game sound development. 
for sure yeah i think i think so um now i haven't done a lot with yes definitely yeah there's going to be a spatial audio conference there's audio for virtual augmented reality um and these tools are being employed in games today um atmos is not the platform i believe it's oro 3d is the uh platform that um wise is using um wise w w i s e by audio kinetic and so they're um yeah, they're definitely using spatial audio, um, uh, and I got to see some of this at the last uh, Audio for Virtual and Augmented Reality conference, where um, uh, when you when you go to this virtual conference, you have to listen for cues as to where to direct your little avatar through this world, and so you're getting spatial audio cues. Not only are you getting cues from, you know, some, uh, something behind a building that's over there, but you're also getting occlusion effects. So you can set it so that a building or that an object that's in the way of another object actually, you know, can make the other sound object dip, right? So, um, and then how, you know, understanding how sound bounces off of walls. Uh, if you're in a virtual space, uh, all that stuff, you know, is is being included in game engines and it's totally fascinating to learn about as well. So definitely a transferable skill. Yeah, and you said thank you. They answer these questions. Um, yeah, another question I was going to ask, just regarding regarding some of that on the earlier question, was do you think there's more work and more opportunity for graduates now going into the industry than when you first started, seeing as there's more media outlets? Yes, uh, everything is different. Um, I am on a um, job search engine because, you know, I'm out there competing with you guys, so watch out. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, in all seriousness, I mean, you've got people from all skill levels that are competing with each other. But the advantage I think that new graduates have is um, a, a lot of it is in game audio um, and machine learning and artificial uh, intelligence and all, you know, there's there's places where sound is being deployed and employed that, you know, um, old farts like me don't, you know, I don't interact with as much of that stuff as you guys do. So you have um, a contemporary social media edge, you have um, the gaming edge, and when I'm on, I think it's UK Music Jobs, um, just looking for, you know, whatever um, little thing that I think, for example, podcasting or, or, or whatever, um, then um, there's a, a lot of uh, audio, um, let's see, dialogue editing, location, um, excuse me, localization, editing, um, audio, uh, sound designers, tons and tons and tons every single day, every day um, on audio, uh, musicjobs.co.uk, there's, there's like audio designer job. There's Soundlister, um, which also has a job opening. So yeah, there are jobs out there. Um, and I don't think that you should, you know, necessarily worry about competing with me. I think you should worry about what is it that you want to do you know, um, if you want to be a designer, then be a designer and, you know, start um, getting on these these job boards. And even if you're not ready to look for a job, just just pull them up and see what they're looking for. You know, I think a lot of times they want you to have worked on a triple A title or something like that. And then now you've got to figure out how to get on part of a team that does triple A titles, game game titles. If you don't want to work in games, there's radio. If you don't want to work in radio, there's film. If you don't want to work in film, there's television. If you don't want to work in any of that stuff, there's music, there's music licensing, there's, um, you know, a, a bunch of um, performing gigs. So there's there's stuff, you know. Okay, yeah, I guess from you, what you're saying and looking at your career as well, myself, um, you've obviously done a really vast number of jobs and that's where I do a lot of different hats, really. And you were saying about um, the transitions, not always up Transition is not always easy. Um, right. But I just, just wonder, like, considering your role now and what you're doing now, I'm sure all of those things come into play and have given you a better overview of, of in, in microscopic detail of what each person does in, in working maybe below you or, or alongside you. 
And, um, and how, how do you find, find all of those roles have helped? Ooh, um, yeah, I mean, like going back to like, I think there was one of my slides on my last presentation where I had like 24 skills that I had developed, you know, and they're, they're all relevant, you know. Um, if somebody wants to, so how have the various skills helped me? Um, I think it's just knowing where where you excel, knowing exactly what it is you want, and being able to help people when you don't fit. You know, so for example, um, I was looking at this localization job, and I'm like, holy crap! You know, I don't know if I want to sit there and grind out that lines and li like thousands of di lines of dialogue every day. But I know, having done sound restoration eight hours a day, five days a week for three years. You get freaking fast at Pro Tools editing. So if you wow. want to get freaking fast at Pro Tools editing, take a job like that, and I mean, you will, you know, you'll be fast and efficient, and and no workflow, and I think you'll gain gain confidence that way. So even like these these um, these jobs where it seems like mundane and repetitive. Um, you're still working with a team. You still have to meet deadlines. You still have to be um, accurate, you know, attention to detail. And you get and you get fast and you get confident. And, you know, for some people that might be a good place to start. So <laughs> the, I think the advantage is, you know, it's like any old person. I'm 51 years old, <laughs> right? Any old person is just going to know a lot. And if if you know, I may or may not seem intimidating. It might, you know, I don't know how I come off to you, but um, I was 21 years old once. And when I was 20 years, 21 years old, you know, the stuff that I was doing in school, I'm like, I could totally do this for a job. You guys could totally be, you know, dialogue editors and music editors right now because you're do you're using these tools, you know. So you need to get out there and network and find somebody that's gonna give you a chance. That's where you should focus. All right, okay. You didn't talk much about your um, your Todd Rundgren sort of project at all in this in this lecture. Um, yeah, just be interested to know a little bit more about that and and how you sort of take on a task like that. Oh, you mean the radio story I did? No, was it the? Didn't you do a band thing for Todd? You did some music at Todd Rundgren. Oh no, I, I saw Oh, yeah, and I played, yeah, he came to the University of Colorado and we played on stage. That was freaking knee-bending scary. Um, but, yeah, I played with him. But that was just like a visiting lecture thing. He came to UCD for a week and he spoke with what? the students. And, yeah, it was it was amazing. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, right, cool. maybe, maybe we could get him to come to our school. I know people. Yeah, that, it, it would be cool to have Todd come over, so. Yeah, so I've got another question here from Steve. Um, it says, in your 30-year career, how have the aesthetics of sound production changed within films? Are you nostalgic about um, any outdated technology, or is it more anything goes if you're good with your chosen tools? Yeah, anything does go if you're good with your chosen tools. Um, so nostalgia for things, you know, I think people are, I think my, people my age are angry at that things are so loud. And it's not because, I think there's a lot of reasons that things are loud, and I don't think loud is necessarily bad. I think that we have more headroom, we have more powerful amplifiers, and we have more speakers than we know what to do with. And it's louder, you know, but I think, we shouldn't be aiming for louder. We should be um, aiming for cleaner. And I love clean, you know. Um, anytime I hear, so for example, there's a surround sound album that was done in 2006. And just in terms of the best sounding audio, I would listen to Donald Fagan's Morph the Cat. And I can't type it, but Donald Fagan, I'm Steely Dan, Morph the Cat. This is the cleanest. <laughs> It's the cleanest album I have ever heard. And I think that, you know, talk about life goals. I would love to be on a production that is that freaking clean. And it's clean and it's in surround. 
And um, I, I, I mean, that's, I think that's the epitome, whether it's film, music, whatever, this is just a, a compact disc, but um, so in terms of the aesthetic, if it's clean, you've got me, you know, if I don't have to deal with noise and if I don't have to deal with distortion and if the reproduction system is clean, you know, like going to um, Lester Square Odeon, I think it's Empire Lester Square, is that an Odeon? Um, I saw Frozen there. That sounded good. Frozen 2, you know, and there's this scene where the big rock people come out and they sounded like rocks. Like, what? Like, how did they do that? They made it sound like huge boulders that were people were walking. That's freaking incredible. That's some sound design. That's, on, that's some next level stuff. And to be able to have it on a system that can reproduce that in terms of the low, you know, earth moving and this, the texture of these grinding boulders, go see Frozen 2. Why haven't you seen Frozen 2? Now I'm upset. <laughs> go see Frozen 2 and listen to the rock people moving. You know, that kind of stuff gets me excited. Super good. I hope I answered the okay. question. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I'm, um, yeah. Yeah. I'm not nostalgic so, for anything. Sorry. I just I just wanted right. to throw in my nostalgia. I mean, I, I go back sometimes and try to watch old videotapes. I can't. You know, I'm like, how did I even stand it? So anyway, I'm not nostalgic for the past at all. <laughs> I guess I guess it's whatever works as well for the project, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm well, so sorry, I just realized we've got to um timetable in a break. Um, ah, and okay. we're nearing the end of the session. Oh, but, um, if anyone wants to just quickly take a break, or Leslie, if you want to kind of take a break and a sip of water, please, please do so. Okay. Um, I'm just really sorry, I completely forgot. Um, Stuart, do you have more questions? I can see Matthew's also got his hand up. Just take from Matthew from and then... Yeah, that's yeah, right. Sure. Sorry, I missed that. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, yeah, one, uh, just a couple of points. One thought is everybody should join the AES as a student member because the uh, the benefits of being an AES member, especially as a student, is that, like, for example, you can go behind the scenes at the Royal Opera House and you can hear the Sony installed 7.1 BMW 802D system, by the way, which is absolutely ridiculous or you can go to the science museum and hear the archives or not hear the archives look at the archives of the, the uh, tone generators and the oscillators that were being used in the 60s and the 70s and the kind of thing that we'd be, we'd be writing about in our essays and uh, so for the benefit of like of the wider group now I've, I've had the privilege of having several research papers published by the AES but when uh, for, for the benefit of everybody else when writing an abstract for a research paper for the AES, Leslie, what would you recommend that people include in a 250 word abstract when submitting a paper? Oh, there's a, um, uh, that's easy. Go Leslie. I, I should know this by heart. Um, there's like five things you need. What we did, why we did it. So the importance of the project, the conclusions that you came up to, the conclusions to which you reached, the, the conclu your conclusions, and then the other two. Um, the methodology. Okay, so what you did, why you did it, your conclusions, how you did it, which you're going to expound, expound on. And then the magic fifth one that I can't remember right now. I'm so, I'm so disappointed in myself. That's two things I can remember. Um, but yeah, a good 250 word abstract has got to have what you did, why you did it, conclusions, how, and insert magic. <laughs> oh, you know, if you if you gave me, we're at, we're we're taking like a 60 second break. If what if I get my um, I can go get my uh my research strategies book and I can tell yeah, you we could take a minute break I mean I know we're yeah it's the end of the session but um we can totally take a minute yeah. break yeah yeah just just let me get, gather a couple assets and then I'll be right there yeah, right back a quick um question in between from Lauren 
Um, are you teaching on the sound for screen module next year? I think I am. Um, I was just talking to Milo today, so yes. So a tentative yes. A tentative <laughs> yes, yeah. Brilliant. And we've got a question from Tim, um, but I'll maybe wait for you to look up whatever you were looking up. Right, yeah, yeah, the ingredients for a good abstract. This is a book called Research Strategies that I used to use to teach with. And um, it had a like the perfect summary of what goes in a great abstract. And of course now I can't find it. I love this book. I can't find what I'm looking for. Uh, go ahead with the question. I'm, I'm not finding it. Darn it. I think you got most of them. I can't imagine what else would be in there apart from those four things and the magic. So <laughs> maybe why it's why, why it's new or why it needs to be done or I guess yeah. why we do it. Anyway, let's go with Tim's question. So Tim asks, um, what is the number one most important mixing tip you can give from your experience, number level. one most important mixing tip. Your levels, check your loudness levels. So if somebody says we want it to peak at negative 0 0.1 um, decibels full scale, that doesn't mean that it's loud enough and it doesn't mean that it's too loud. You cannot use a full-scale measurement of your song or your film mix to tell how loud it is. You need to use loudness metering. So invest in a good loudness meter. That's my number one mix tip. Very good. <laughs> Very clear answer. Um, Yusuf, you've put a question on the board. I don't know if you are able to come on the mic and ask it or whether you'd like me to ask it you could write oh, in the chat yeah um yeah sorry um i forgot what what the question i asked was i can post it for you i thought it was quite a good one thank you yeah i think it was to do with um music videos um, yeah oh yeah so um i was gonna ask um uh, uh, about uh, music video verite and mm -hmm. how in, how impactful the nature of uh, music ver music video verite is in the for you in the production of a uh, music video. Um, so it was like, um... compared to like uh, uh, other methods. It's all about immediacy. So like if I. If I watch a music video, I can get bored, you know? Um, I mean, there's some cool ones, like there's this Burberry ad that I saw using um, the singing in the rain thing and they are punching ice balls, the <laughs> hail coming from the sky, but it's, and there's no singing in it, it's just dancing. And I'm like, dancing is cool. But when I watch an artist lip syncing their own song, you know, I kind of get bored, I really do. But, I mean, if you watch somebody actually singing, um, you know, like in your social media scroll or whatever, it's, you know, either you don't watch because, you you know, you see this kind of thing all the time or there's something about it where it's like, wait, I'm going to unmute and I'm going to check out what this person is doing because they've got, you know, like 100 likes and 
they're really emoting and I, un, you know, I unmuted and I'm like, oh my, man, you know, this person's talking to me, you know, it's like that immediacy um, that you get. And that's what I was trying to go. I mean, like back in the day, you know, when I was uh, college age, uni, going to uni, um, you know, I would see uh, Bjork did one, uh, a hyper ballad where I knew she was actually singing because I had the CD and I'm like, that is not, that is not her lip syncing. And so I'm like, what the, you know, and so I'm like, like keyed in on Bjork singing this, I think it was hyper ballad. Yeah. Hyper ballad. And I'm like, you know, they, they went with her, her real voice. Why did they do that? And then they cut to the lip sync version. I'm like, you know, what's, ha what's happening here. And then there was um queen did a video uh, for one vision. And they had, they were using video uh, footage of them in the studio. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. Because I'm looking at them recording the freaking album and it's Queen, it's Freddie Mercury, it's Brian May and Roger Taylor and they're freaking off, off John Deacon. And this is when, you know, everybody was alive, you know. And I was like totally keyed in on that. I'm like, mom, come check it out. My mom was a Queen fan too. Um, and there's something about that immediacy, right? Like this is really happening. These guys are super talented, you know, or Bjork is super talented or whoever I'm watching. And the fact that, you know, they're not pretending to sing. There's something about it, you know. I could go on and on. But um, trying to get that immediacy and that realism is sort of my raison d'etre. Raison d'etre. Uh, sorry. Uh, usually when... Um uh, usually when a music video is shot, they um, they have the music on in the background, right? And then they have the, uh, then just for synchronicity, the artist kind of um, is thinking, uh, but they don't actually like use the sound from the, from like, from that, from them. It's the, it's, they put the actual music on top later on, right? Okay. Um, Okay, so yeah, I was just like interested in that worked. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, it's it's hard to shoot a video verite, um, you know, because you have to have mics on location. And you know, when I shot that one video verite um, that I did, uh, Future Jazz Project, give them what give them what they want. So if you look up Future Jazz Project, give them what they want you'll see the video that I'm talking about. And, you know, I wore these guys out. They had already recorded the song. You know, they had a CD out with the song on it. We did like 25 takes and they played the song over and over and over again for the cameras, you know. And the bass player told me, he's like, my neck is done. <laughs> you guys said, I feel like I have whiplash, you know, from all those takes. But you know, and there's so many examples. Um, I think if my website, musicvideoverite.com, is up, you got to see the one by Nile that uh, called um, "Let the Beat Build." It might not be a. I'll be so surprised if that thing comes up. I'll let you know. Anyway, Nile N Y L E, "Let the Beat Build." If you're super interested in that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Leslie. Does anyone have any last quick questions for Leslie before we thank her and say au revoir for the afternoon? Um, I mean, there's a quick question from James that I thought maybe you could answer. That um, he James was asking, so you, you're a member of prestigious societies such as the Motion Picture Science Editor and a voting member of the Recording Academy. How do you gain these titles? Um, for the Recording Academy, I think you need a certain number of album credits and somebody has to nominate you. For um, MPSC, you need a certain number of film credits and somebody has to nominate you. So um, yeah, start building those credits and start networking and then people will know you. And then if you meet somebody who's on the Rec in Recording Academy or MPSC, you ask them for a nomination and that's how you get in. And it's not that hard. <laughs> Good. Thank I know. I'm just taking myself down a notch, but yeah, just don't, you know, don't be intimidated by any of this stuff. You know, we're all humans and, and let's go. Let's make a career. 
Brilliant. Thank you so much. That was a really inspiring lecture and very grounded and down to earth and I think very encouraging for all our young sound artists and engineers and everyone else in between creatives here. So fantastic. Thank you. Thank so you much. so much, everybody. I'm really honored to be here and glad to answer your questions. Um, you can find me on social media if you ever want to reach out. Thanks, Leslie. Yeah, and some of you will have the pleasure of being taught if you take the um, sound, sound for screen option, I think is in year two. Fantastic. Um, if anyone can stay back from the BA students just for one minute, I um, would just like to gather some feedback, but if you need to go, then don't worry. So I'll just say thank you so much and um, wish you a lovely winter break. Leslie and everyone else who's leaving us, um, yeah been fantastic to have you. Thanks everyone. Stay safe. Happy yeah. holidays. Yeah, stay safe. Bye. Take care.